Welcome to another edition of Biblical Life TV. We are going to uh, pick right back up where we left off last week in 1 John, chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. I'll give you a chance to find it in your Bibles. And hereby we do know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. And I want to pick up just with this and then go into the, into the next verse. We didn't really cover this. We talked last week about how keeping the commandments is tied in with having the love of God matured in us. But then he goes on to say, hereby we know that we are in him. First, he was dealing with knowing him. And if I really know him, I have a heart's desire to want to follow the word of God. I have a heart's desire to keep the commandments of God. But as I begin to move because of that love for him, it is then proof to me that I'm in him. And it's proof to those around us. You know, it seems like in today's church, in today's world, we look at a lot of things to see if, that, if you're in him. We look at church membership. We look at the way that you're dressed. We look at how you cut your hair. We look at everything except what God determines. You know, I could have a beard down to here and look like I'm on Duck Dynasty and have, and have you know, real long hair now to, to a, a lot of people right now in the body of Christ, especially in the more fundamental movement, I wouldn't be in him. Because I don't fit the mold that they have made. And so many churches and so many denominations have established a mold that you have got to fit into to be in him. And they have not looked into the mold that Almighty God set within his word. That if you have this evidence, it's evidence first that you know him. And as you begin acting it out in your life, then it's proof to you and proof to those around you that you're in him. Then we need to pick up here with verse 6. And he that saith he abideth in him. First, I'm in him. And if I'm abiding in him, not visiting him, not just occasionally being a Christian, but if I say, but he that saith I abide in him, ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. In modern Christianity, everything's about an event. We turn our church services into events. It's an event that we can encapsulize in about two hours if you're a real radical one. If you're, if you're really streamlined, I had one pastor tell me that their whole church service is about as long as my message. I mean, that's really cutting it down. And so we, we, we encapsulate it into that and we have done our deal for the week. And then we can go live our lives and not really be bothered by God again until we get to, uh, to next weekend. That's not what it's saying here. If I say that I abide in him, it's not about the event, it's about the walk. And it has always been about the walk from the very beginning. In the cool of the evening, God came down and walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. Abraham was called to walk with God. Moses walked with God. David walked with God. And how we have gotten this thing into an event, that's why we're almost like uh, especially within a lot of the charismatic movement and, and the revival movement, we get to be, we almost tend to be groupies. We got to run to this meeting and run to that meeting and run to this one because only with that in, uh, within that event can you do anything for God and be touched by God. And the truth is God recognizes events. The Bible says one night that Jacob wrestled all night with God. And God changed his walk and changed his name after that event. And so if you have a real event, it changes your walk. If it doesn't change your walk, you may have experienced Hollywood, but you haven't experienced an event with God. An event with God will always change your walk. And so we need to understand events are pivotal places within our lives, but it's only pivotal if it changes the walk. Only if it changes the walk. And one of the ones I want to bring out is in Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. It said, Enoch lived with God sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. 
And Enoch walked with God after he had begat Methuselah 300 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of, of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. His walk was so powerful it wasn't, an event was so powerful. Now, we can look at the, the book of Enoch, and, and Enoch had some events. And the, the Jewish people in the time of Jesus believed that it was an, an inspired book, uh, Enoch 1. Now, Enoch 3, you get into some crazy stuff. I kind of wonder if it wasn't added later. But Enoch 1, uh, until the Catholic Church pushed it out of what they were considering as canon. In fact, the Ethiopian church and some of the older line churches to this day still believe Enoch is a part of canon scripture. But he had some events. But it wasn't the events that prepared him. They were pivotal places within him because his, you, you see this, you see that with, when you read the book of Enoch, his walk empowered a greater event which changed a little bit more of his walk and God was able to use him. And it finally got to the place where he just stepped on over. He, he did not die. Does not, does not mean he, God took him, that God killed him. It means that God says, you know what, you're so unique in history that I am lifting you out of the physical realm. I'm pulling you, body and all, up into heaven because later on I'm going to send you back. And most evangelical commentators believe that Enoch is one of the ones that's going to be the two witnesses that are in the book of Revelation. Many other also believe the other one's Elijah that God took physically in his chariot and into, into heaven. And so our walk is what empowers us. Our walk is our testimony. Our walk is what keeps the devil out and keeps God in. It's not events. We got to stop being event-oriented and pay more attention to the walk. If I get my walk right, 90% of my spiritual warfare is done because the way that I'm walking, I'm keeping the devil out and I'm keeping God in. Because every door that's opened in your life is done by something you do in your walk. Every door that you close in your life is by something that you do in your walk. If I can be led by the Spirit of God and walk in the commandments of God, I am constantly closing the door to the devil and opening doors for God. Now, another one I want to look at. Is Genesis 17 and 1. We have dealt with this one many times. And it says, When Abraham was 90 uh, years and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am Almighty God, or I am, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be thou perfect. In Hebrew, it sounds completely different than it does when we read it in English. That in the original Hebrew, what God was saying is, I am Almighty God. I'm come to walk with you, and as you walk with me, I'm, that walk will cause you to become the man that you can only become in me. That's why the walk is so important. We need to take notice of the walk. In fact, it's basically the same call that Jesus gave us in Matthew chapter 4, 19, when he said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Almighty God came in the flesh, met those fishermen on the, on the, on the shores of Galilee and said, come walk with me and I'm going to make you into something you can't be without me. That is the call of the Christian. I know that I'm abiding in him because Jesus maintained himself in the Father by his walk. I don't do anything unless the Father tells me to do it. I don't say anything unless the Father tells me to say it. He maintained that walk, and then the Bible says that we're supposed to walk just as he walked. You need to, see, you need to understand that we are the template, or Jesus is the template. John set the standard, walk as Jesus walked. Now let me ask you a question. Did Jesus walk the earth as a Gentile? Who was he the king of? He was the king of the Jews. He was, he was, he has a direct lineage to David. He, he was of the, of the tribe of Judah. And so he was a kosher eating, feast keeping, commandment walking rabbi. Now he had one up on everybody else because Jesus is unique. He's the one, he is almighty God come in the flesh, so he gave the commandments to Moses. And so you have, you have several thousand years, or a thousand years or more, that 
the rabbis have been debating how to walk the commandments of God, and some of them they got right and some of them they got wrong. The author of the commandments came, and he, and he lived a public ministry of three and a half years, and in those three and a half years, he perfectly kept all the commandments the way he intended for them to be kept when he gave them to Moses. Why three and a half years? When God gave Moses the original Torah cycle, it took three and a half years to go through it because they would only hear them when they would, they would gather during the feast time. Three times a year you would come to Jerusalem, and that's where you heard the word because it was the Levi's job to read it to you and to teach it to you. Only when we get to the synagogal model after Babylon was it able to be done in one year. So Jesus lived the Torah perfectly, publicly. Now, he lived it all his life perfectly. There was not one time that he ever violated the Sabbath, violated the feasts, or violated one commandment of God. There was never a time that Jesus had a pork sandwich or a bacon sandwich. Never did it. Although I might add he could have had a cheeseburger, just for those that are out there, okay? But he kept all of it. And if I'm going to walk the way that he walked, what's John saying here? I got to recognize the commandments. And then Jesus is the matrix. Jesus is the model for the proper expression of those commandments in the earth. I look at how Jesus kept the Sabbath. I keep the Sabbath the same way because he's the model. I keep the feast the same way because he's the model. In fact, all the feasts and the Sabbath are about him. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. And so it's impossible to walk like him without observing those things. Now, in modern Christianity, we have done it, and the Apostle John would say, you know what, church in the end days? Because when you really look at, at, at how John wrote his books, he wrote the Gospel of John, he wrote the book of Revelation, the final things that he wrote were his three little epistles. So he wrote First John, knowing full well everything he wrote in the Gospel and in the book of Revelation. So, you know, guys, I know what's coming. God has shown me. So here's a little epistle to prepare you for the Antichrist spirit, to prepare you to, be, to have your armor on and to be ready and not be deceived when this thing comes. And so you've got to walk like Jesus walked. And if anybody knew how Jesus walked, it would have been John. The apostle Paul could have maybe alluded to, well, I saw him in the temple a couple of times. John was there from about the very beginning. He saw all the things that Jesus did. He was at the transfiguration with Peter. He was there. He saw it all. And so if there was any iota of not keeping the feast or Jesus ever hinting about not needing to worry about the commandments, if anybody would have known about that, it would have been the Apostle John. And here the Apostle John is saying, you got to know who he is. He is Almighty God come in the flesh. You got to know the opposite spirit, what it does. You got to know that if somebody says that they know him and don't keep his commandments, they're a liar. Because the spirit of God on the inside of them, whether they know it or not, will will push them to begin keeping the commandments. Because God is not divided against himself. If God's word is eternal and infallible, thou shalt not kill still applies for today. But you have to look at them through the matrix of who Messiah is and how Jesus would express them to get the full realization of the power and the purpose of that commandment. So walking like Jesus without keeping the commandments, the Sabbath and the feasts are biblically impossible. I think that's one of the reasons why we're having such an emphasis once again on understanding the Torah understanding the feasts and why the devil has worked overtime in muddying the waters. Because there's just as much as there's crazy stuff going on in the evangelical movement, there's crazy stuff going on in the charismatic movement, there's absolute crazy stuff going on in the messianic movement. The devil is saying, listen, you can't get this and you can't get it right. You can't get it balanced. It's about the walk. It's not about you thinking you have some great revelation and you're made more holy because you keep the feast. Let me tell you something. If you're walking the commandments, keeping the feast and keeping the Sabbath, that's basic. That, that's 101. Somehow or another, we think that we're keeping those. Man, we're way up here and we're superior to everybody else. No, you're still in kindergarten working your way out. That's basic stuff. You're learning your alphabet. You're learning how to put sentences together. That's the basic stuff. And if you can't get that, you're not going to get anything else. 
because everything in this book lines up with that, every part of it. Now, I want to go into, and, and this is interesting, in, in, in 1 John 2, 7 and 3, 11, he gets in, let me read it, I want to explain some things to you. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye have heard from the beginning. Isn't it interesting how many times he says, in the beginning, in the beginning was the word. He keeps on going back to Torah. Because God tells us the end from the beginning. This old commandment is a word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you. Or he says, I'm going to show you a new perspective or I want to reinforce this once again. Which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is no occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whether he goeth, because the darkness hath blinded his eyes." Now, we, and I've seen Christians teach on this in about 10 different ways, that, if you, that unless you give this kind of gooey, gooey love, that uh, you're not fulfilling this and you're going to stumble. They forget, he says, I'm writing you an old commandment. It's something from the ver- that you have heard from Bereshit. It's the story of Cain and Abel. And it was going on in his day, in John's day, and it's going to be essential. There's, there, there is a, a book that, uh, uh, that I wrote a chapter for that Dr. Tom Horn's putting together called uh, Blood on the Altar, the Coming uh, War of Christian versus Christian. This is exactly what this scripture is talking about here. It's going to happen first in the church, and then it's going to happen in the world. Since God teaches the end from the beginning... We need to keep his instruction here in the context it was written. Now look, he's contrasting light and darkness. He's contrasting those who say that they know God and those who pretend to know God. He's contrasting those that are actually commandment conscious versus those who completely ignore them and choose to do it their own way. That's really what's going on here in the the book of 1 John. And now he's referencing the story of Cain and Abel, which is hatred versus love for the brethren. Now, in the story of Cain and Abel, we have a true believer versus the religious believer that insists on walking according to their own ways. That's the story of Cain and Abel. Abel offered the sacrifice exactly as God had instructed. In other words, because he loved God, and really walked with him, he followed God's commandment requiring the sacrifice exactly the way that God did it. God says it's going to have to be an animal. It's going to have to be a blood sacrifice. This is how you're going to do it. You've, You've got to sacrifice it this way. You've got to burn it on the altar this way. And so Abel expressed his love, and because he had a real walk with God, he did simply what God said to do. Abel's different. And if you understand the able spirit, you're going to understand exactly what we're seeing a lot of times on Christian TV. Cain offered a sacrifice according to what was convenient to him. He chose to disregard God's instructions and to do it his own way. How many people we see doing that today? I don't care what God's word says. This is what I choose. Well, well, that's been done away with. This has been done away with. That's been done away with. Sin has never been done away with. And if sin was never done away with, then the commandments cannot be done away with because sin is the violation of the commandments. The blood of Jesus, when I come under that blood, it brings me into relationship to him so that now I can move just like Jesus moved and kept the commandments exactly the way that Jesus did. But the Cain spirit says, no, I don't want to do it that way. That way is too hard. That way that way is not popular. That way is not really the way that's convenient for me. Therefore, I will do it this way, this way, this way, and this way. Relationship with God brings you in line with God. Religion tries to create some pseudo type of thing to make everybody think that you're walking with God when you're not. Now let's pick it up here in Genesis 5, 7, uh, 5 through 7. It said, but Cain and his offering, he, God, had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. 
A religious spirit will, first of all, will get mad at God when God doesn't accept the things that he did because he didn't even give God any consideration or any consideration for the instruction that God gave. This is the way that we choose to do it. You know something? I have heard that over the years by so many Christians. They ignore the instruction of God's word, and they simply say, well, this is the way that we do it. You know, God doesn't care. God doesn't care. The only thing God cares about is if you love me, keep my commandments. To obey is better than sacrifice. This is my way. And since God is absolutely perfect, absolutely righteous, absolutely right in everything, there can be no error in God for God to be God. And so when he said there was a reason to do that, there's, there's a reason to do it. Not only to walk with him who is absolutely holy, but when I violate that, I'm opening the door for the enemy. And that's exactly what happened to Cain. When he chose to do a sacrifice different than what God had commanded, it opened the door. Look on what it says on here. It says, but in verse 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why has thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt be accepted. Just go back and repent, Cain, and go ahead and offer the sacrifice just like your brother Abel had done it, and it's going to be great. Or how about in Revelation, go back and do the first works. Get the basics down because everything that we've been dealing with so far in 1 John is Christianity 101. It's the basic stuff. But let me tell you something. If you don't get the basics right, that's why when you go in the military, they have basic training that teaches you how to march, that teach you how to use your weapons, to teach you basic warfare strategies because everything that goes on after that is built upon the foundation of that. And any, any soldier that doesn't know how to handle his weapon, no matter what tactic he uses, it will fall apart. He can, he can be a great tactician, but if you can't put, take apart, clean, and put together your weapon, you're not going to last past the first battle, no matter how great a tactician you are, because everything has to be based upon the foundation of the basics. And the Apostle John is saying, listen, the basics of the Torah, these are going to be the crucial things in the end days. This is how you tell those that are really walking with Jesus. This is how to tell those that have the spirit of Cain that like to pretend that they're walking with Jesus, but don't really do anything. They, they have this religious facade about them. And here's what's going to happen to them. God's going to give them a chance to repent. There's a lot of call right now to major portions of the body of Christ. God is saying, listen, I'm getting ready to bless those who have kept my commandments that are really walking with me. And they're really walking to honor the blood of Jesus and the cross of Christ and the word of God. I'm getting ready to bless them. And when that begins to happen, the canes are going to start getting mad. And God's going to say, listen, go back and do what they did. Give up the things they gave up to pick up their cross. The only way that you can pick up the cross is you've got to empty your hands of the stuff of the world first to pick up that cross. So there's some things I'm going to have to put down before I can pick up. That's why the apostle Paul tells us to take off the old man before you put on Christ. And when we begin doing that, we're getting ready. And in fact, I think it's so interesting with what Rabbi Cain has been talking about. We're getting ready to enter into a Shemitah year this next year. R Rabbi Khan. Who would I say? Cain. Cain. Khan. No, no. We're entering into a Shemitah year, which is also a Jubilee year. And as God, a Shemitah year was supposed to be a blessing year where all your debt was wiped out and, and God kind of hit this reset button thing going on. And those that refuse the Shemitah year for the faithful becomes a year of blessing, but for those that are disobedient, it becomes a curse. And so a, a Jubilee year for those that are faithful will become a blessing. But for those that are not, it will become a curse. And those that the curse begins to light, they'll start pointing over to the Abels and say, it's all your fault. Look at what he says down there. He says, now, if thou wilt do well, thou shalt, shalt not be accepted. 
But if thou do, doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Sin lieth at the door. There is a sin right now in the heart of Cain's because they wanted to do things their own way and didn't want to be inconvenienced with changing their lives or their churches to come in line with the word of God. And sin is lying at the door in their congregations and in their hearts right now that God is saying, listen, I'm, I'm going I'm to show you. I'm going to begin blessing those that are walking with me. I'm going to begin really blessing those. Because right now, a lot of what we have in the past have considered was blessing has been nothing more than the elite funding people that were off to make that the model of ministry. Mr. Luciferian, they don't want you living by this book. They don't want you to have a real relationship with Jesus. As long as you're really walking with a relationship with Jesus, they're like Balaam that can't do anything against you until you start receiving their doctrine and getting off the word so that God judges you. That's why Jesus warns us about the doctrine of Balaam. But then it goes on to say here, he says, and unto thee shall be his desire and thou shalt rule over him. Uh, let, me, let me unwind the King James there just a little bit because we don't speak Shakespearean anymore today and I want to read this out of the Amplified Bible. It says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you do not well, sin crouches at your door. Its desire is for you. That sin desires to have mastery over you. That sin desires to explode in your life and take everything over in you so that you can begin doing its bidding instead of God's bidding. And then it goes on to say, but you must master it. Even though your flesh doesn't want to do what God says to do. And you feel, you feel righteous indignation, supposedly righteous indignation, because they're being blessed, but they don't do church the way that you do church. And, and you know, we, we've been doing it this way 200 years. Let me tell you something. This stuff's been going on for thousands of years, and it's always been in print. And God doesn't care how our denominations or our church group says we're supposed to live. If it doesn't line up from Genesis to Revelation, it is not the word of God. It is the traditions of men, which Jesus said makes this book of no effect. It is time to get back in the book. What we need today is a revival of the word of God. I don't need Holy Ghost goosebumps anymore. I don't need a Rondai Shondai anymore. I need something that so affects me that when I leave this place, I start living by the book. And this becomes, this becomes my benchmark. If God says do it, I do it whether I understand the logic behind it or not. Many times the, the reason comes after you've been doing it two or three years and you start seeing all the doors that start shutting in your life to the devil and you start seeing God do some things. You always see it by hindsight, not by foresight. Just do it because he said to do it. And if God says, I don't like that, now this is deep. Let's just not do it. If God, you know, when, when, you're, when you're absolutely a righteous God and absolutely a holy God, he doesn't have to explain to you, don't do that. No more than when kids are little and they start learning and their basic operating systems are being installed, you know. Kids are learning how to do things. It's don't touch the stove when it's on. And really a little child, you can try to explain to them why they shouldn't do it. That's, all, that's over their head. All they need to, don't hurt, burn. That's all. And so God says, don't do, burn. Don't do, release as fires of hell, don't do. And once you get that down, then as you mature later on, he can show you why. But we're arguing, I don't care if it says I'm going to burn. I don't, I don't think it's going to burn me because... I'm still listening to the serpent of the garden and I question the motivation of God of why he told me I couldn't do that. Come on. But you need to realize, listen to the pleading here. There has been a pleading going on in the spirit for, for a number of years. He's telling those with the spirit of Cain, come on now. You know what's right. It's in my word. It's in black and white. Quit trying to find ways around it. And many times the, it takes more effort to use mental gymnastics to try to circumvent the word of God. It takes more effort to do that than just to yield and do it. And I have literally seen ministers get up in the pulpit and they don't, I have tried my best to try to keep things in context for you and to tell you the context in which it was setting, setting, setting. You can tell I'm from Missouri, setting. But what they do is they will read a part of a verse here 
and they'll jump over and read two or three words out of here and two or three words over here and never set them back into the context and begin making a doctrine that seems to do away with a lot of what God said. How many know that that, that, that that takes a lot of mental gymnastics and efforts to do it instead of just reading the whole thing and how about just doing what God says? Because I love him. Because I have been made acceptable in the beloved. So we're, we're headed toward a time, guys, that there is going to be the Abel Christians versus the Cain Christians. There's going, there's going to be this conflict coming in the church. In fact, it's already beginning to kind of brew. And the ones that are walking in hatred are the Cains who want to silence and to kill, assassinate the character of Christians that are keeping the commandments of God and trying to walk with Jesus to the best of their ability. We also see that same Cain spirit in much of the liberal media. They talk about the tolerance of everything except for those who have the spirit of Abel. And then they try their best just to get them out of the way, to slander them, to just to, you know, it, it's like somebody who's steeped in sin and is maybe the, somebody that we really need to pray for because they're off so bad and you can tell they're hurting and they're tattooed from one end to the other and pierced from one end to the other because they weren't happy with who they are. And they're struggling and, they're, and, uh, and they'll, they'll have great mercy and say, listen, you just need to set this person the way that you are. But the, the person is really trying to walk with God they will push you down. They will call you every name in the book. They will slander you and, and, and do everything to get you to duck and cover because they don't want you to even to show your head. That's the Cain spirit. The Abel spirit would say, listen, you know what? Brother, I love you just the way you are, but let me, let me, let, let's get to the root of the hurt that you have in your heart. Let's give that to Jesus. Because you're responding out of love. The ones who respond out of hatred is the spirit of Cain. I'm going to destroy anything that dares come against my agenda. That's the Cain spirit. And so we're going to see that it's going to first start in the church, and then the ultimate expression of it is those, the, those with the Cain spirit will embrace the mark of the beast. They will line themselves right up, whether they claim to be a Christian or not, they will line themselves up with the spirit of this world, the, the, the Antichrist and the spirit of error. And as soon as they fully tap into, this is the way that we're going to do things. And it's going to represent two things. I, I think there is going to be a blending of transhumanism with the liberal movement and somehow or another, and I'm, I'm still working on putting all the pieces together, it's all going to mesh in, into the UFO phenomenon and Islam. It's all going to amalgamate together. It really is. Unbelievable. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like you can see it, but there's two or three pieces of the puzzle that I need to put together to, 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 to amalgamate my theory together, but you can see the pieces coming together. That once it's there, and once you receive, because the mark of the beast is the true spirit of Cain, I'm going to do it my way. Not only am I going to do it my way, but I'm now listening to Lucifer, and we've had leaders in the UN that have said we are headed toward a one world government that is Luciferian. And unless you pledge absolute allegiance to Lucifer, you can't be a part of it. I mean, you start looking up these quotes and they're, they're alarming. Because Lucifer promised you don't need to do things God's way because we, the serpent got them to question God's character, to question God's commandments and say, listen, if you listen to me, I can make you like a God salvation and immortality. That's one of the things that, that transhumanism is beginning to, to say is, listen, you're never going to die. If you become a transhuman and become post-human, you're going to live forever and never die. Well, if you never die, you never have to face the judgment unless you rule out that Jesus is coming back. And then I don't care what kind of body you have. You could, be, you could be a terminator when Jesus shows back and you will be a flat tin can about this thick by the time he gets through with you. So there, there is no bypassing the judgment of God, but that's what they're going to Salvation, another way. And once they receive that, the Bible says they're going to raise up and kill everybody who doesn't have the mark. That is literally the Cain and Abel scenario. But it's first going to start in the church so that it separates the remnant from the pretense. In, in First John, very powerful for where we are today. And then it goes on to its ultimate expression. Of the mark of the beast and those marks. And what's so interesting, we said, Mike, I don't believe that. 
Go back and read Genesis. The Bible said that God put a mark on his forehead. On Cain's forehead. Because of what he did, he was a marked man. It's all there. The, the more that I understand the Torah of God, the more that I, you connect the dots. God constantly is just blowing me away. You read the book of Revelation, it lines back up. From the beginning, the conflict, the whole backstory, understanding where we are headed, understanding who Jesus is. It's all there in, in the book of Genesis and it's played out all throughout the Torah. That's one of the reasons becoming, I, I think that's the, the whole reason I think for the Hebraic movement and I even think even some of the craziness is it's forcing pastors that never go before Matthew. It's forcing them to try to come against some of the crazy stuff that's going on, that they're actually going back for the first time and reading Torah. If you actually read it and begin understanding the premise of it, you begin connecting the dots from Genesis to Revelation. You can't do it from Matthew to Revelation because you're, it's, it's the end of the story, and you've missed the first mini-series that prepares you for the conclusion. It's impossible. Well, Father, we just ask that you would take this word today, that you would, Father, cause us to examine ourselves. Father, let us have hearts like Abel, that we love you, that we walk with you, and we keep your commandments as an expression of that love and the gratitude that we have for the cross. And Father, help us to readjust ourselves so that as we enter into the Shemitah year, this next year, that we're going to walk in your absolute blessings and learn how to walk in your divine provision and protection to be ready for that which is going to be released upon the earth. We thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name.